This video is the continuation of my previous video titled as a classification of proteins part 1. The link of that video it is given in the i button as well as in the description of this video. In that video we had seen the classification of protein. Classification of protein based on function, classification of protein based on shape, classification of protein based on chemical nature of proteins. Now, classification based on chemical nature of protein, there are three different groups. One is simple protein, second one is conjugated protein and third one is derived protein. We had seen full detail of simple proteins and conjugated proteins. In case of derived protein, as its name suggests, they are derived from either simple proteins or conjugated protein. Now, how they are derived? They are derived by one of two processes. They are derived either by denaturation or by the degradation. If they are derived by this denaturation process, we can call them as a primary derived protein. And if they are derived by the degradation procedure, we can call it as a secondary derived protein. So, now let us look further about the derived proteins. So, derived proteins, they have two subgroups, right? The first one is the primary derived protein and second one is the secondary derived protein. Primary derived protein, it is of the denatured variety, whereas secondary derived protein, it is of the degraded variety. If we look at the primary derived protein, they are further classified into three subgroup. The first one is the protein. Remember, this is not the spelling mistake. Its spelling is as such only. The second one is the metaproteins and third one is the coagulated proteins. Now, I suggest you that whenever you remember the subgroups of primary derived protein, you remember in this sequence only. The reason is that as you move from protein to metaproteins and metaprotein to coagulated proteins, there is an increase in the degree of denaturation. That means proteins will have a mild denaturation, metaproteins will have somewhat moderate denaturation and coagulated proteins will have a maximum denaturation. Now, in case of protein, as we know that it has very mild denaturation, so we have to provide mild condition to the simple and conjugated protein, right? So, proteins, they are produced by the action of water or very dilute acid or base or enzymes, right? And these proteins, they are insoluble in water. If you look at the examples of proteins, we have three examples, myosin, adestan and fibrin. Myosin, it is derived from the myosin. Adestan, it is derived from the elastin. And fibrin, it is derived from the fibrinogen. The second group over here is the metaproteins. Metaproteins have a higher degree of denaturation than this protein. So, to get higher degree of denaturation, we have to provide somewhat strong condition, right? So, metaproteins, they are produced by the further action of acid or alkalis on the protein. And metaproteins are soluble in nature. If you look at the examples of metaproteins, we have acid metaproteins and alkali metaproteins, right? So, if they are denatured by the acid, we can call it as a acid metaproteins. If they are denatured by the alkali, we can call it as a alkali metaproteins. The third group over here is the coagulated proteins. Now, coagulated proteins, they will have a maximum degree of denaturation. So, for that, we require very harsh condition. So, this harsh condition are provided by either heat or alcohol. So, we can say that coagulated proteins are produced by heat or alcohol on native proteins. If you look at the examples, we have cooked egg albumin, cooked meat and alcohol precipitated proteins. In the cooked egg and cooked meat, we are using heat as a source of denaturation and in alcohol precipitated protein, we are using alcohol as a denaturing agent. Now, if you look at the secondary derived protein that are of the degraded variety. Now, degraded means what? I had explained to you in the previous video also. Degradation means hydrolysis of the peptide bond. See, in case of denaturation, there is only, uh, only the weak interactions are broken down right? Peptide bonds are not affected in denaturation. Whereas, in case of degradation, weak as well as strong interactions are also affected. That means, peptide bonds are also broken down in case of degraded, degradation, 
right so here once what will happen if peptide bonds are broken down there will be a shortening of peptide chains right so this secondary derived protein they will have a shorter structure than its native protein so secondary derived proteins they are further classified into three subgroups the first one is the proteosis which is also known as albumosis the second one is the peptones and third one is the peptides now here once again i suggest you that you remember these three names in this order only the reason is that as you move from proteoses to peptones and peptones to peptides there is a increase in the degree of degradation these three are arranged in the ascending order right so let's first discuss about the proteoses or albumoses now this proteoses they will have a only mild degradation right so they are simply hydrolytic products of proteins these peptones are somewhat moderately degraded more than this proteoses so they are the hydrolytic products of this proteoses if this proteoses they are further hydrolyzed we can get a peptones now these peptones if they are further hydrolyzed what we can get we can get a peptides so we can write further hydrolytic products of peptone right now if we compare the size of that polypeptide fragments of all these three we can see that proteoses or albumoses they will have a larger structure whereas peptones they will have somewhat smaller than this proteoses right and peptides they are very small fragments of the peptide so they peptides have a smallest and proteoses has the biggest structure now as all these three they are shorter than its native protein right so all are soluble in water by virtue of their small size but if we compare the solubility of all these three this peptides are going to be the maximum soluble peptones are going to be moderate soluble and proteoses are going to be mildly soluble so all of course all these three are soluble in water but the degree of solubility is different so if we want to precipitate this proteoses we can precipitate by ammonium sulfate so proteoses are precipitated by ammonium sulfate what about peptones see peptones are more soluble than than this proteoses right so of course their precipitation is going to be difficult so see proteoses they are precipitated by ammonium sulfate but peptones they are not so are not precipitated by ammonium sulfate we will require other harsh chemical to precipitate this peptone so peptones are precipitated by phosphotungstic acid that we have to remember now if we talk about the peptides they are the maximum soluble right so they are not even getting precipitated by phosphotungstic acid so there is a no question of ammonium sulfate so for the peptides we can say that they are neither precipitated by ammonium sulfate nor precipitated by phosphotungstic acid now one interesting aspect about these peptides is that they are only small number of amino acids are joined by peptide bond it may be dipeptide or tripeptide remember dipeptide and tripeptide these both words are misnomer why see in case of dipeptide there are not two peptide bonds there are only one peptide bond in case of tripeptide there is no any three peptide bond there are only two peptide bonds so that's why they are misnomer see in case of dipeptides there are two amino acid right and for joining of two amino acid only one peptide bond is required so in a essence it is monopeptide it is only one peptide bond but two amino acid whereas in case of tripeptide there are three amino acid joined by two peptide bonds okay so this tripeptide has three amino acid and two peptide bond now to find out the presence or absence of protein we generally do biuret test right if biuret test is positive we can say that proteins are present if biuret test is negative we can say that proteins are absent so what is basically this biuret test biuret test basically detects two or more peptide bonds it cannot detect one peptide bond right so if we look at the dipeptide it has only one peptide bond so biuret test will give a negative result with the dipeptide whereas biuret test will give positive test with all other peptides all tripeptide tetrapeptide pentapeptide all the proteins will give positive biuret test except except for this dipeptide right so because this dipeptide is a exception 
to this biuretase, we can also call this dipeptides as a abiuretic proteins, right? So that's all about the derived protein. And with this, I complete the classification of proteins. If you have any query or confusion, please write it down in the comment section below. Thank you.